Welcome everyone. We're delighted to have you at this particular seminar this afternoon. I'm John Raymond, editor and publisher at Zonderman, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Krista Tippett. Krista is the host and creator of the public radio program Speaking of Faith. This program is broadcast on over 200 stations nationwide and online at www.speakingoffaith.org. Krista is also the author of Speaking of Faith, Why Religion Matters and How to Talk About It, available in the bookstore. She's our guide today for a conversation on politics and Christianity with Shane Claiborne, Greg Boyd, and Chuck Colson. Before I turn things over to Krista, though, I just have a reminder for you. I'd like that all of you please turn off your cell phones in this seminar because it is going to be recorded for potential radio use. So it would be great if uh, we don't have those interruptions. Thank you. Welcome. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> all right, there you can. Can you hear me now? Um, <coughs> I'm delighted to be here and really thrilled to be here with these three men. Um, as John said, we are taping this. It's a bit of an experiment. We're not sure that we can make an hour of radio, coherent radio, with four voices, but we're going to try. Whether that works or not, uh, I think this is, I hope, I intend for this to be an important conversation for those of us in this room, at the very least. Um, if you've heard my program before, you know that it's that I tend to do one-on-one, -on -one, in-depth conversation. I'm kind of the anti-hardball, anti-crossfire uh, <laughs> format. I no sound bites allowed, and so I'm. This is this is a new experience for me as well. I'm juggling a few more balls than usual, but I think that so much will happen up here among the different panelists that uh, it will be an exciting conversation. And again, I think an important conversation. There has been a lot of hype lately around what some of my fellow journalists call the internal debate about the future of evangelical Christianity, specifically concerning the relationship between religion and politics. Um, we are not going to have a debate here this afternoon. I wonder in, <laughs> we're not. Uh, I won't let it happen. I, I also wonder if in any case this is not so much appropriately a moment of debate as a moment of important discernment within evangelical Christianity. And the three men who are sitting up here with me today represent three generations. They were each formed and have been formative figures in different moments in American life as, and as evangelical Christians have grappled with this in different ways. Um, and each of them is a visionary figure within the evangelical movement and an important voice uh, in and for the present. So my hope is that we can engage in some collective discernment here for an hour and a half. And let me tell you about the format. We will speak for about an hour, about 45 minutes in. I have a clock here. And I'm going to let you know that people will be coming around if, if, in about 45 minutes. If you have a question, if you'd like to write on the back of the little piece of paper that was on your chair, there will be people coming around to collect those. And then John Raymond will lead a Q&A. So we'll speak for a while, and then we'll turn this into a larger conversation with you. I'm going to give very brief introductions, because you know these men. Uh, Charles Colson, Chuck Colson, among his many accomplishments, is the founder of Prison Fellowship International. He's a broadcaster and columnist and the author of many books, including Born Again, God and Government, and most recently, The Faith. Greg Boyd is the founder and senior pastor of the Woodland Hills Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. He and I both live in Minnesota. We had to come to San Diego to meet. <laughs> That's the way the world works now. Um, and he has also written many books, including Letters from a Skeptic and The Myth of a Christian Nation. And Shane Claiborne is a co-founder and member of the Simple Way community in Philadelphia. And he's the author of The Irresistible Revolution, and he also has an election year book for us called Jesus for President. <laughs> um, so I'd like to begin with Chuck Colson. And I hope you he might help us put some of the questions
questions and challenges of the present into some perspective. Um, I wonder, when you first came to Washington, how would you describe the notion you held and the notion that our culture held about the role of Christians in politics? Well, it's a debate that's gone on since the beginning of the church, obviously. Mm. Uh, and it's gone back and forth. Uh, excesses on the church part from per in periods of history, excesses on government's part. Uh, I wrote a book in the mid-80s, uh, which was called Kingdoms in Conflict, which was a rebuttal against the uh, excess reliance on politics by Christians that was then the emerging religious right, mm -hmm. uh, because I believe there was a fine balance to be drawn between the two spheres, uh, which necessarily intersect, because people are irresistibly religious, they are also wired to connect, as a recent study at Dartmouth called it. That book, which has now been republished, God and Government, became sort of a handbook for what's the permissible role for Christians in public policy. Mm -hmm. I argued that the, the public square ought not to be naked, that people should be able to express their views freely and openly. As a matter of fact, Christians, I believe, have a cultural mandate to do precisely that, to work for justice. Martin Luther King being a very good example of a Christian who did so explicitly uh, because of the commands of Scripture. But at the same time, we have to be very careful not to find ourselves in the hip pocket of a particular political movement because the kingdom of God is transcendent. The kingdom of man comes and goes. The city of God uh, will be destroyed, Augustine said, because it's built by man. The city, the city, of, the city of man will be destroyed by man because it's built by man. The city of God can't be destroyed. Let so me you have ask to keep you, those two balances separate. Um, I, I just reread this week your first book, Born Again, which was your story. And it's a mm -hmm. fascinating book. And it was an important book at the time. Um, in your early political career, you were not a religious person, but by any definition, the way you are a Christian now. You, you talk about how then, and, and, and even Christians who were involved in politics it, it kept it, it was on the sidelines, it was secret, it was compartmentalized in a sense. I mean, you describe um, that after you became born again, you discovered, as you write, to your astonishment, what you call the veritable underground of Christ's men all through the government. <coughs> And I wonder, and within kind of 10 years of that happening to you and that being your experience, there was this new evangelical entry publicly, openly into electoral politics. And I wonder if you could just tell us, as you watch that unfold, why did it happen then? Um, what, well, you have yeah. to remember, my book, Born Again, which you just referred to kindly, uh, came out in 1976. The title was Born Again. It came out during the New Hampshire primary. Someone ran up to Jimmy Carter, who was then an obscure governor running for president, right. held the book cover up, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm born again. And it hit the front pages of the New York Times, your old journal. It uh, was the cover of Newsweek, the year of the evangelical. 1976 was a definitive time because evangelicals rallied behind Jimmy Carter. We forget that the evangelical vote was actually decisive for him in the 1976 election. Christians had been in the fundamentalist uh, hinterlands through most of the 20th century. They'd stayed out of the political limelight. They'd stayed out of politics, basically. They didn't want to contaminate themselves, which was wrong. Uh, but that brought them out suddenly, and it was the abortion issue, among other things, that really suddenly riveted the attention of Christians on the public arena. Uh, I saw some of it when I was in the White House as the abortion issue was heating up. Mm -hmm. But uh, it transformed evangelical from a pietistic movement into a very activist political movement. But that's why I wrote Kingdoms in Conflict, now God and Government, because I saw it happening that Christians were almost naive. As I wrote in Born Again, I thought the And you saw that who, at the time, even yeah, you felt that at the time. people who came into the White House to present their arguments to the president, the meekest and humblest of the group were the, were the Christians. Mm. And so uh, I saw how easily seduced Christians are by political power. I believed it was necessary to take a prophetic stance in which you are for the government, you're against the government to be for the government, and mm. uh, wrote that in, in the 80s. But things, things dramatically changed from 76 through the mid-80s. 
I happen to think now we're maturing. I think we've gotten out of that adolescent stage of, of uh, being a, a, a power block or a special interest vying for power, where we're taking a much more sophisticated look at what it means to be a Christian in public life today. Mm. Now, Greg Boyd, you were also becoming Christian, going to seminary, becoming a pastor, in fact, founding a church and pastoring a church. Mm -hmm. In years in which this evangelical political power was full blown, and you found yourself grappling with that as a pastor, um, you, you've written that that you experienced many members of your congregation and your fellow evangelicals in public life to have no ambiguity about how true Christian faith translates into politics. Right. And you experienced that to be a problem. So talk to us about that. Well, my, my issues, I, I first became sort of, I came to awareness about all of this in the 80s with the rise of the moral majority movement. And, um, I, there, there was something about that movement. As an evangelical, I felt like I was supposed to get on it, you know, and I'm against abortion and these other things that they're for, but the way they were doing it struck me as, as ugly. Um, the center of the Christian faith, as I understand it, is to imitate Jesus. He incarnated the kingdom of God. Uh, it always looks like Jesus. It always involves serving others and sacrificing for others, tra transforming the world by being in the kingdom. And this didn't look anything like Jesus. So that was the beginning of my questioning, like, you know, is this my tribe or not? And then uh, in the early 90s, I went to a, a, a megachurch celebration on the 4th of July. I did a little seminar as part of it. And uh, this is right at the end of the first Gulf War. And uh, they sang a lot of patriotic hymns, which was already making me uncomfortable. They had a major cross and a major flag all together. And then they showed this video uh, with this patriotic music and with this military general uh, describing how God had given us the victory on the first Gulf War. And at the end of it, there's a, you know, the song just explodes, it's triumph, there's a flag waving as a silhouette in the background. And then you see three crosses and four fighter jets fly down over the crosses and separate. <laughs> and it freeze frames there, it says, God bless America. And the crowd stood up and was just cheering. Um, I, you know, I, I started crying. Hmm. And other people were crying too, but that's because they were happy. I, I was crying because I was so grieved by it. And that's when I really began to seriously think about the distinction between the kingdom of God, looking like Jesus, serving the world, transforming it by being beautiful on the one hand, and the power over mindset of government on, on the other. And I thought something has gone profoundly wrong there. And then uh, finally, in the, uh, before the 2004 election, I was getting an unprecedented amount of pressure, as I think most pastors of large churches were, uh, to steer the flock in a certain way. Pressure from within the congregation or M from outside? From, well, it, what happens is the people in your congregation watch Christian television and listen to Christian radio, and there are all, all these folks saying, you know, if, if you really need to represent sort of the Christian faith by voting this way against the marriage amendment, da 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 da. And so we were getting, I was getting a lot of pressure on that, plus a lot of mailings and sometimes phone calls. And I just decided it was a teaching moment. <laughs> And so I did a six-part series on called The Cross and the Sword. Six-part, uh, a six-week sermon, extended yeah, sermon. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was just the time to lay out why uh, in our congregation, it was really not that new of a philosophy, but I'd never been so clear on it, uh, the, the distinction between the kingdom of God, which is about transforming by power under people, serving them, dying for them, loving your enemies, on the one hand, and the kingdom of the world on the other. And um, laid it out in as starkest terms as I could. Um, explained why we don't have a flag in our congregation. We're not here to rally around America or any other country. We're here to rally around the kingdom of God. Uh, why we're not going to jump on this political bandwagon. Wagon. How political issues are more often than not very ambiguous and good and honest and decent and Bible-believing people can have the same values, but they translate into the complexity of politics in different ways. Even on things like gay rights and, uh, and abortion mm -hmm. and the Iraq War and all of that. And our job as kingdom people is to focus uh, focus on living out the kingdom, uh, which is, I think, the main problem with the American church. Uh, it's not the wrongness of our beliefs, but our lives don't match up to the little we do believe. And, uh, and to focus on that, that's our one bullseye, our one duty uh, to God, and um, let the politics take, take care of itself. And you had, your a, you had a pretty dramatic response to that sermon within your congregation. Yeah. You had people who left. Yeah. You had, it sounds like, people who were grateful to you for saying I never this. had such a, uh, it, it was surprising to me. Um, on the one hand, many people came up crying uh, for joy because they always felt alienated 
uh, in their evangelical church because of all the flag waving and the politicizing and all that, uh, the kind of militant sort of uh, Christianity. So they were just overjoyed. Uh, but then I also had uh, some people who were absolutely uh, aghast. Um, their, their, their thinking had, and on the part of some, was, was so fused with America and nationalism and patriotism and politics that for a pastor not to support the quote-unquote right way is to support the wrong way. Hmm. And therefore, I must be a liberal uh, and, and whatnot. And so we had about 1,000 people uh, eventually. 1,000 uh, out of 5,000 5, regular Sunday. About 20%. Mm -hmm. You also got attention. You were on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah, that got picked up after the book, uh, the cross, uh, the, oh, what's the name of the book? after you turned this sermon. Uh, Middle of Christian Nation, okay. yeah. And, but, you know, and a question I want to ask you, I'm always a little bit, um, I'm always a little bit skeptical. Again, my, my fellow journalists, I love them, but I, <laughs> we have our them. own internal debates. Um, I, I've really noticed in these last few years, especially when journalists write about evangelicals um, and they, they see something that evangelicals, evangelicals are doing, they think because they've suddenly seen it, it's brand new. It's headline news. Uh, pastor preaches sermon contrary to yeah. the electoral trends. Sure. And I wonder, and that really was that front page story about you in the New York Times was, you know, here, here's what evangelicals are doing, and then there's this one lone voice in the wilderness. Oh, the righteous. <laughs> and I wonder if, yeah, and I do wonder if you experience, did you experience yourself to be a lone voice in the wilderness, or was there, were you in dialogue with other pastors and with your congregation in a way that suggests that even then a process of discernment was taking place? Well, I felt quite alone in the uh, evangelical world. Uh, I though I'm aware that Christianity is much broader than the evangelical world, and so there's many Mennonite brothers and sisters and others who would very much be, you know, in line with my philosophical outlook. What's different is that they wouldn't find themselves in my congregation. So that was a little bit unique. Uh, since the book came out, and especially since that New York Times article, which really surprised me, uh, although I think she did a wonderful job and was very fair, uh, but since then I've learned of, of, uh, that there's a lot of people. I don't feel alone anymore at all. There's, there's a new generation of folks who have the, uh, a clarity about the vision of the kingdom of God and therefore don't trust uh, anyone to translate that into political terms. Uh, they recognize the ambiguity of politics and, uh, and keep their focus on the kingdom. And so I, I'm very encouraged by that, actually. So here's um, something that a member of your congregation said to the New York Times reporter. This is someone who left. They said, you can't be Christian and ignore actions that you feel are wrong. A case in point is the abortion issue. If the church were awake when abortion passed in the 1970s, it wouldn't have happened, but the church was asleep. And I wonder when I read that, just this, this simple but strong sentiment, you can't be Christian and ignore actions that you feel are wrong. If that doesn't kind of summarize this core unease, sure. um, that has galvanized evangelicals in politics in, right, the last, right. in the last 30 years and is, is also going to perhaps be interpreted differently, right. but is there as you look for the, toward, towards the next 30 years. And, and see, that's a perfect illustration. In fact, that was the number one issue that people were mad about, though the marriage amendment thing was right behind it. But see, what, what I would argue there is that we are to, do, we are to transform the world. Absolutely, that's the call. Uh, this isn't a privatized faith by any means. Jesus didn't have a private faith. But the way you do it from a kingdom perspective is very different from the way you do it from a world perspective. And our trust is to be that we're to bleed, we're to sacrifice, we're to replicate Calvary for women who've got unwanted pregnancies, to express the value of the unborn and the value of the woman, uh, and then to go full term with them, not just tell them what not to do, namely have an abortion, but, but rather to, to live life with them. I, I think a person who puts a second mortgage up on their house to fund a woman to go full term and to help raise the child is far more pro-life, even if she votes for pro-choice, than a pro-life person who votes a certain way. Okay. But the other thing, though, is that, that even here, I, can have a, I do have an unequivocal, uncompromising pro-life stance, nonviolence to the core, but that doesn't mean I'm going to vote for the pro-life candidate, because it may be that I think that, uh, that the, the greatest indicator of abortion is poverty, and this person I might think is not gonna, is gonna help that issue. And there's a multitude of issues that can affect how a person votes or how they march or whatever, and that's fine as long as we say, that's not the kingdom, this is the kingdom, and let's do the kingdom. Okay, 
Chuck Colson, I want to I want to talk to Shane for just a minute, and then I want to let you react to each other. Um, I, I'm, a, I, I'm going to let I'm you react to each other. Here. I'm going to permit that. Shane, just following on what Greg just said, in your new book, you write this. The question is not, are we political, but how are we political? Not, are we relevant, but are we peculiar? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think that the, it's uh, not in question whether or not Christians should engage the world that we're living in. Whether or not, um, I mean, it, our, our allegiance to the God of heaven has to affect the way that we live on earth. Uh, but the, Jesus had plenty of political options, you know, to flee society and go into the hills to, you know, fight with the zealots. And he was very peculiar in how he was political. Uh, and, and I think that's part of what we... Uh, are in danger of losing in all of the hunger and drive to be culturally relevant, you know, is that we can use the, lose the distinctiveness of the kingdom values and the upside down uh, rationality of the kingdom of God. Um, and, you know, one of the examples that we give is the Amish, who are peculiar, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're different. They've created a different culture in this world. And you can, you can hear the Amish kids, you know, growing up, like, why don't we get an Xbox? Well, because we're, you know, we're a little different, you know, or whatever. And I think like, and yet the way that they reacted to the, uh, this act of terror in their school when their kids were shot, you know, it fascinated the world by grace, uh, by uh, just this scandalous, redemptive love. Uh, and so we've got a section of our book called The Amish for Homeland Security. Um, <laughs> sort of going, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that looks good, you know. So, so I, I think that, that's, but, but I, I think what, what a beautiful thing it would be if we do have that sense that we're not to conform to the patterns of this world, but we're to, to have a renewing of our mind, a fresh imagination. What if people look at Christians and they're like, wait, why are they driving their cars off vegetable oil? You know, and we're going because we love the creator and we believe that we should live differently on this earth, that we should, we should honor uh, God by how we care for the earth. We should be ending poverty. We should be working in the prisons, you know. So I think that, that that's part of the call that I see throughout church history is this is nothing new, but over and over our Christianity gets infected by the world we're living in. And so people go to the margins, they go to the deserts, they go to the abandoned places of the empire that they're living in, they rethink what it means to be Christian, not just to, to be a believer, but to actually be a disciple of Jesus that is um, transformed and converted in, our, in the way we live. So Chuck Colson, I'm curious how you're hearing all this and what you're Well, I'm listening is. to Shane and agreeing with everything he just said. Uh, particularly because he recognizes, unlike the Mennonites, that most mainstream Christians believe they have to be engaged in the moral issues of the day. Actually, the abortion issue is the oldest issue the church has dealt with. It started in the first century when the Didache, which was a discipleship manual distributed to all Christians, decried the practice of Rome and Greece in infanticide and abortion. The first letter written by a, a Christian bishop in the second century, Athenagoras was written to Marcus Aurelius to condemn the Roman practice of abortion. It's not a new issue. It has been battled through the centuries, and the church has always been in the vanguard of that. You know, uh, Shane mentioned I should be working in the prisons, and I, that's where I've spent my life. What drove me into the prisons was the massive sense of injustice, the way we were treating a lot of people in prison. And I ended up addressing state legislatures across the country. Had I followed Greg's advice, I would have just tended to the kingdom and felt good about my relationship with Jesus, but I couldn't. I took the issue of justice into the courts from a Christian perspective and argued it expressly as a Christian. Martin Luther King did exactly the same thing. If he'd followed that advice, we wouldn't have had the civil rights movement. The very words that came out of Greg's mouth, I don't mean to take harsh what? issue with you, but Not about just tend to the kingdom and let politics take care of itself is exactly what the slave owners said during the Civil War. That was their whole argument. Their whole argument was they were very good Christians and they were living as pious Christians and the fact that they owned slaves had nothing to do with their Christianity. It had everything to do with their Christianity. Christians have fought slavery from the beginning. If you look at great transcendent moral issues, Bonhoeffer, a hero of yours and a hero of mine, Bonhoeffer stood against, in the confessing church, against Hitler. Thank God he did. Wilberforce stood up on the floor of the parliament in England and stood against the slave trade. 
and fought a 20-year battle. We've just seen the movie Amazing Grace, which is an extraordinary film about an extraordinary person. And his leadership in fighting moral issues, at the same time, he was writing books about spiritual renewal for individuals and books on holiness. He did the two together. And he said, God's laid before me two great objectives, the abolition of slavery and the reformation of manners. He meant to live as Christians and tend to the work of the kingdom, but you can't ignore moral evil. It, 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 we're called to it as Christians. It, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't strike our conscience, there's something wrong with us. When we see things are wrong. So there's, there's clearly a tension here. <laughs> but but I, 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 I think if I, if I can say this as a public radio host, I think it's a faithful tension. Yes. Does it, is it necessarily an either or? Are these different callings? I could weigh in on that. Uh, I don't think it's an either or. And here, here's, I think, the main, I, I just read Chuck's book last week, and I agreed with about 90% of it. You read The, the Chuck, Faith? Uh, no, the uh, God book? and Government. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, I was surprised, actually, how much I agreed with it, because there you say how the main job of the church is uh, to live it out, the little platoons, like what Shane's got, uh, great stuff. But see, it's not an issue of whether or not we should engage moral evil or whether or not we should engage the polis as a whole. The question is, is it our primary job, and you even deny this, it's not the main job of the church uh, to be running the government or to think that we're supposed to affect the government. That's not the main job. The main job is to live out the kingdom. And that comes as, uh, as a secondary thing. And I guess my main objection would be this. I felt, feel like sometimes uh, what some Christians do, and if the shoe fits wear it, but let's see, that we put the, poli the political cart before the kingdom horse. Our, the bullseye is the kingdom, living it, getting my congregation to live 24-7 kingdom principles and all of its radicality, because that's very rarely done. If we get that done, I think we'll have a lot of clarity about how to engage the culture in a lot of ways, including politics. I'm not against that. But if we shoot at the politics, all the while the church isn't living the kingdom, you, you mentioned the book Unchurched this morning. Uh, you know, it shows that the Christians in America differ very, very little from the broader American culture. It's almost indistinguishable. Well, here we are, a broken church, profoundly broken church, trying to fix the world. I say we should first take the log out of our own eye before we start uh, taking the, the speck out of, uh, out of others' eye. Now, that doesn't mean we suspend all solidarity with prisoners. I, think, I love what you're doing with prisoners or with African Americans uh, in, in the Civil War or the, with the oppressed. Enter into solidarity with them. You say, ouch. But that's different than saying we can resolve the complex issues of, of abortion or, or whether or not the U.S. should go to war in Iraq or, you know, all, the all do you, do, you, do you, within ones. your community, within your church, try to resolve, whatever that means, resolve the issue of abortion? Do you, are, you, are you modeling that, are you living with that in a different way? That our job is to sacrifice for the unborn, yes. Who you should vote for because of where they vote on that issue, no. And, no. and when I say let politics take care of itself, that's what I mean. I'm not saying ignore politics, but you know, Augustine so told uh, an abbot one time, love God and, and do what you please. Because if you, if you love God, everything else is going to follow. I would just say love God and vote as you please. Because if but, you're really loving God, but, you know, the vote um, will be I mean, clear. one thing I've, I've read you say in response to some of your critics is that, is that you're not saying, um, I don't want to lose my train of thought here, but this is not live radio. It's edited, so I can lose my train of thought if I feel oh, like lucky. it. Oh, um, You, um, sorry. Where is this? You have said that we narrow our idea of public invade engagement to political engagement. Yes. And, and I, but I, what I also hear you possibly doing is, and, and, I, and maybe the evangelical movement as a whole has been guilty of this, narrowing the idea of political engagement to electoral engagement. Because, I mean, again, when mm. I asked a minute ago, is it an either or? I don't, when Chuck Colson talks about dealing with state legislatures to, to get uh, good faithful models, to, to get them implemented, to make things happen, um, that's, that's not necessarily much, I mean, you're dealing with elected officials, but that's not about who you vote for, right. per se. It's, oh, it yeah. is about engagement in politics no, I, I at a different level. I agree, and Paul, there's precedent for that in Paul, when he's being arrested, he says, hey, by the way, I'm a citizen, you know, and therefore I have a right not to be beaten. He's not against talking to political powers, but that's very different than thinking that we can resolve all the political issues, like we have any kind of special wisdom about that. I don't think following Jesus gives us any special wisdom about how to fix government. I don't think you can leave your moral convictions behind when you go in the voting booth. Of course not. If you believe as I do, and as the Catholics teach in Evangelium Vitae, 
issued by John Paul II, that the defense of life is part of the gospel, then for me to go into a voting booth and vote against what is the central truth of my life, that is my commitment to Christ, is impossible. I can't be schizophrenic. So I think the duty is to say, we're not part of a political movement. That's what I said in, in, in God and Government. We aren't going to be beholden to a political party, but we are going to vote our convictions, and we're going to work for our convictions, and we're going to work for justice in the public square. And when I go into a voting booth, I not only look at, I look at the abortion issue transcendent, because it, to me it's part of the gospel, but I also look at uh, defense of, of uh, marriage. I look at the help for the poor. I look at people who do not promote justice, and we have 2.3 2 million people in prison today because we have had discriminatory sentencing laws, all kinds of injustices. I won't vote for people who support that because I was in prison. I won't vote for people who will take human life. So I, I don't see how you can separate it. You, you can't, you can't, but you see, you and, you and Jim Wallace, for example, have the exact same convictions. He would agree with everything you just said, but he would vote very, very different. Can, can you acknowledge that he, he's passionate, just as you are, about justice and poverty and criminals? But the way he translates it is very, very different. That's all I'm saying. And so don't, christen, don't call one of these Christian. Leave room for the ambiguity. I, That's all I'm saying. I would take Jim Wallace as a sincere Christian. I know him. He loves the Lord. There's no question about that. We have some profound disagreements. Yes. But he is more activist about being engaged in politics than is whatever succeeds the moral majority today. His latest book, which is out, sure. is Join the Democratic Party in order to get justice. And but the, po the he's point is explicit okay. about it. It is. Uh, really? Shay, I haven't read right. his latest book. A lot book, of directions so we could go from there. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say that I, I think one of the biggest questions that uh, is, is the idea uh, of political embodiment. How do we live out our politics and 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 uh, what I love about Jesus is he wasn't just offering a political platform or uh, you know a nuanced political agenda but he is embodying who he is he's born a baby refugee in the middle of a genocide lives struggle and and and, um, and so I think part of what we need is we need new political heroes and sheroes, you know, which like for me, M Mother Teresa is one of those. You know, I worked with her in Calcutta, I, l I learned from her, and, and uh, she, she's just done so much to the cause of decreasing abortions and, and honoring life, you know, from the cradle to the grave. But it wasn't because she went around wearing an uh, abortion is a uh, murder shirt, you know, like she said, if you don't want your baby, you can give it to me. Absolutely. And that has integrity to it. You can't argue with that. You know, even Bill Clinton, not known for his pro-lifeness, you know, invites her to, to speak at his prayer breakfast. And, and, and it just radiates that hope. And to me, that's what we've lost. Because I, I do want to decrease abortion. I'm pro-life, which is why I don't want abortions and I don't want militarism in war. And, and yet, yeah, like, that also means that, like, I have an obligation, you know, to figure out what to do when a 14-year-old girl on my block gets pregnant, which happened, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and how do we, how do we embody a, a different future together with her? Uh, and, and, and I think it's the same with, with the prisons. Like, we, we um, Dr. Martin Luther King said so well, he said, we're called to be the Good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch on the road to Jericho. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say maybe the whole road to Jericho needs to be reimagined, right? <laughs> and when we have two point, you know, uh, when, when you have 2.3 million people in prison, one in every three African American men, and those prisoners are, you know, producing $700 million worth of goods a year, half of it going to the U.S. military. Like, this is a problem, you know? Like, we have to start to rethink, like, uh, what, what's happened, and so I think that's where the, the, the movement of justice that affects political change happens with Dr. King and throughout you know, church history, powerful movements of people of faith. So uh, I think that, that idea that we're, we allow the integrity of our lives and of our communities you know, to radiate hope uh, is, what, is part of where we're missing. Because you can have all the right answers and, and great rhetoric, but, uh, but I, I think that, that what we're really hungry for is a Christianity that, that has substance that people can wrap their hands around, that embodies the gospel that's good news to the poor. Um, I, don't, I don't know if this will go anywhere, but I, I think I want to throw out a question about whether even the conversation we're having today, even these remarks you're making, which are 
partly about, again, about having a larger view, a more holistic view of what it means to be engaged socially or politically as a Christian. Um, whether some of that is coming out of what has been learned by evangelicals in these last 30 years of a certain kind of political engagement. I mean, that you are building on lessons learned, both in terms of what went wrong, um, and also a new body of experience, a new, more global sensibility that I think, Shane, is something your generation has, mm -hmm. that you're born with constitutionally. But I also think that with the experience of power that evangelical Christians have had, real political power in these last 30 years, there's a larger perspective that comes with that. I don't know, how do you react to that? I wouldn't make any judgments about what is right or wrong based on 30 <coughs> years of experience when you're looking at a 2,000 year history of the church. And we've had excesses that, as I said at the outset, go both ways, but we strike that fine balance, uh, which no one has done better than Augustine in the City of God. That's positive classic of Western civilization. And he would be the last one to say, we don't engage in politics. He would say, we build the kingdom and that is our first task, but in the course of building the kingdom, we care deeply about the moral uh, condition of the society in which we live. And Christians have always done this. We have always been in the vanguard. There isn't a human rights campaign in history that Christians haven't been in the vanguard of. Women's rights were pushed by the church in Rome in the third century, which is one reason that the church exploded, because they brought women in and gave them office in the church, and uh, the Roman, the, Roman citizens followed. So you go back through the centuries, Christians have always engaged the political process when human rights and human dignity and the sanctity of life have been involved. But Chuck right. Colson, uh, well, why don't you say something, Greg? Okay, and then I'll... Uh, the, the thing that's interesting about the early church is that you're right, they did that and it exploded. But the reason it exploded, because they were for life and, and women's rights and all of that, they're very egalitarian. But they did that by being the kingdom. Uh, they, they didn't have anyone, in fact, they prohibited, on the, for the most part, people serving in government. Uh, you know, that, that's of the devil. I mean, they, they really had a dualistic view, but it comes out of the gospel because, you know, Luke 4 has Jesus being tempted with governmental power by the devil. And so they use that to say, you know, don't get involved in that. But our job is to be a contrast society against all that's out there that's manifest the beauty of God's reign, and that is attractive, and it pulls people in. Um, and then, you know, you, you can find throughout history good examples of people in government doing good things, and some of them were Christian, for sure. But, of course, there's also a very dark side to uh, governments uh, and, and Christianity being uh, involved. And you have the whole, I mean, it was shortly after Augustine, uh, you know, after the church acquired political power, where he authorized the state to start persecuting heretics. And that's the first time a violence started being done in Jesus' name. And the rest of the history is, is rather ugly and has brought defamation to the name of Christ. So I would just say we've got to be very paranoid. And I think we, we, we're starting to learn that. I think, That's a big word. I, I think Christians are a little more paranoid okay. of government than Eastern, well, which is well, good. Well, right, and that is kind of what I wanted, where I wanted to go. Because Chuck Colson, I have seen you write with concern. As, as someone who lived through a period of seeing a president, an administration corrupted by power or corrupted in the context of power, um, I've also seen you in writing be, be critical and concerned about hubris that has also emerged, that has also then had the name of, had Chris, been represented by Christians who were in politics. You've seen in some sense that, that dynamic. And, and Shane, you, Shane Claiborne, you've also written about your concern about what happens to Christians, how Christianity itself can be <coughs> distorted by that relationship with power, with government. So, I mean, again, I think, is this some, is this a, it, you say it's a paranoia. Mm, it's a new, a prophetic it's, it's, a ca it's a caution that's come out of yes. this period. Well, Christians aren't perfect. Uh, we're just forgiven. Uh, lots of people have made mistakes. Augustine, one of the great heroes of my life, was wrong when he authorized the state to uh, prosecute heresy. That was a mistake. We've made many mistakes and we correctly repent of those mistakes, but because we make mistakes doesn't mean you don't keep trying to get it right. And there is a right way to find it, there's a right way to work for it prudently, and I believe we are growing up as an evangelical movement because we saw the excesses of the past. I saw firsthand how the political attraction can destroy very good people. 
I have seen in the last 30 years a greater phenomenon than the religious right, and that is the political illusion, which Jackie Lou wrote about in the 60s, in which he said eventually with technology, we'll be able to have instant communications between power and the masses, powerful and the masses, and people will be deluded into thinking politics is going to solve all their problems. That's a serious problem. Mm. And Greg is a good antidote to that because he's reminding us as Christians, don't fall into that trap. Uh, although I think most of the country has. That's mm. where we have political campaigns starting the day after the last one's over and constant politics and chattering of chattering classes on the tube drive me nuts mm -hmm. because we're missing the fact that we're responsible, that we've got to take care of our own behavior and our own church's responsibility. You can't sell it all to politics, which is inherently corrupting. You're right. I had, I've had an interesting echo in my mind as I've been preparing for this conversation with the three of you and reading what you've been reading. And I, I interviewed Steve Waldman last week, who's the founder of BeliefNet, and he was with US News and World before that and Newsweek. He's a veteran journalist. And he's gone back and looked at the founding fathers and the notion of religious freedom and how he thinks um, we in our time have come to look at that through the lens of the culture war and it has distorted, in fact, our view of the founders and of the notion of religious liberty. What I'm getting to is one of the things that shocked him was to find that evangelical Christians were the great champions of separation of church and state, of religious liberty, uh, siding with Jefferson on whom they didn't agree about other things because he would guarantee their liberty. But that there also was a theological dimension to that, which was that religion to be true must be free um, and a sense that James Madison, this is what Steve told me, that James Madison in particular was absolutely an advocate of separation of church and state, not because it would make for good government, because, but because it would make for better religion. He said that you know, whenever government got involved with religion, religion was warped. Yeah. And then I'm reading Shane Claiborne's new book, and you are of a very different, you know, here we are, 2008, and you are this young, the new generation, and you're saying something. <laughs> you're so you are you you are. I got I got here, and uh, one of the now? people at the front uh, of the hotel, they were like, "You're you're one of the speakers at the pastors' convention." No. And then uh, afterwards, they were like, "We like your dreadlocks, Reverend." <laughs> 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 they don't make preachers like they used to. Okay, yeah. so okay, so you're cool. We established this. You're cool, and you are. It seems to me rediscovering that same insight that James Madison articulated, or that those early evangelical Christians in the early colonies Well, and I, and I think, you know, I've, I've uh, got a great friend and teacher named Tony Campolo out in Philadelphia, and one of the things that he always uh, says is, uh, mixing church and, and state is, is like uh, combining horse manure and ice cream. May not do much damage to the, the manure, but it's sure gonna mess up the ice cream, you know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, it, you know, and, and I think like what, what we've seen is, is Christianity at its worst is, is when we fuse these together and it's, it's quintessential in the culture that we're living in where, you know, the U.S. currency says in God we trust, but our economy reeks of the seven deadly sins, you know, of, of lust and gluttony and greed and, 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 you know, the U.S. flag is on many of the altars and, and kind of colonizing this, you know, and, and it's even here at the National Pastors Convention, I mean, there's an exhibit for the U.S. military. And I mean, this is, these are the things that I think create confusion in people. And so when I was in Iraq, I was in, in Baghdad with the Christian peace team uh, in, during the bombing in, in uh, March of 2003. And I went very much because what became so unmistakably clear to me was what's at stake right now in the world is not just the reputation of America but the reputation of Christ and what it means to be Christian in this world. And I want people to know the love and grace and enemy love of, of Jesus. Enemy love? Yeah, mm -hmm. and we're not, we're not uh, in, in a lot of ways getting closer to that. And I think it, that, that it's tricky right now because there, uh, there's a lot of sense, I guess, when you're, when you're pretty disenchanted that there's going to be a new hope, you know, uh, in this candidate or in this party. Um, and. I, I think we have to be very careful of that. You know, uh, George Bush on Ellis Island in, in 2002 said, the ideals of America are the hope of mankind. This light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. And that's very dangerous theology. Uh, but to be fair, to be, to be fair, Barack Obama on the David Letterman show this year said that this country is the last great hope of the planet. 
And that, that's just very dangerous theology. And I think like we know what's the hope of the world. And it's much better than Hillary or Barack or McCain, you know, and, 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 and we can't compromise that. Uh, and, and that's exciting to me, you know. I, uh, I don't know where you got the title of your book, Jesus for President. I haven't read it. I don't even know what it's about. But I love the title because uh, what I find is that we, you know, Christians confess Jesus as Lord. But the trouble is, is that we don't have any lords anymore. And so the word gets packed with whatever meaning you want to give it. But we do have a president. And it really, as, as kingdom citizens, he's our only president. And so maybe we ought to just quit co confessing Jesus as Lord and just start confessing Jesus as president. Because that is a way of saying, whoever is, is president of this country, my real president is, is Jesus Christ, and I'll take my marching orders for him. So great job on the title. <laughs> so a different kind of you owe me on a book endorsement. A different kind of commander-in-chief, you know? Totally but, but I think that, that it, was, it is as radical to say Jesus is my commander-in-chief today as it was to say Jesus is Lord or Savior 2,000 years ago. Okay. Chuck Colson, you wanted to well, say something. I had one thing to that. C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful essay about Christian patriotism. He said, it is not wrong to love your country because God has put you in an area where you're supposed to love the world, but all you can love are your neighbors. Aquinas said the same thing about military service. He said, someone who serves to defend the innocent is acting out of Christian love. So I don't think you can divorce yourself and forget about the fact that we live in a kingdom state our job to make it as righteous and as conforming to God's standards as possible, uh, but imperfect though that's going to be. But you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and also love your country as a way of loving your neighbor. See, I think this is a, a real fundamental difference between us. And I don't know where Shane is on this, but um, uh, oh, you're, you're, you're far <laughs> left of the rest of us, yes. Um, but, uh, the, you know, you, in, in your book, you speak a lot about our dual, uh, our dual commitments, our dual allegiances to God and to country. And uh, that I just, I, I don't know where in the New Testament you get that. I can't imagine uh, Jesus or Paul uh, saying such a thing. Uh, we have an obligation to, yes, we're, we're, we're command, because we have an obligation to our president, Jesus, he tells us to obey the laws of the land as much as possible and to pray for peace. Those are your two engagements. But I don't feel we have any kind of duty uh, towards them to love our country, to, to defend our country, to, uh, I don't know where you get that. And, and what concerns me most, Chuck, is that uh, most of the young Christians that I know who sign up for military service are so nationalized, it doesn't even occur to them that there might be any conflict between picking up a gun and killing someone because Bush told them to on the one hand, and Jesus saying, love your enemy, do good to your enemy without any qualification, serve your enemy. I at least want people to ask the question, but it shows you how, how blended the Christianity of America has been to nationalism. And my, my passion is that we've got to show the radicalness of the kingdom first and then worry about all this other stuff. But if this doesn't get done, there's nothing worth getting done. The New Testament's pretty clear that you render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. The New Testament's also very clear that you are to respect, respect. the... Uh, authorities because they are appointed by God to wield the sword in order for us to live peaceable lives. So government has a role, biblically, well established by 2,000 years of reflection, that the job of government is to preserve order and to do justice and to restrain evil. Sure. That's the job of government. And so we support that. And a military man, I serve my country proudly and would again, a military man takes an oath to support the Constitution because it's God's ordained instrument to preserve order. And without order, you've got chaos. But Chuck, so. Shane, I think Shane wanted the same flavor. <laughs> it's raising his hand for the review uh, of it. <laughs> uh, I, I think that this, this idea that we're to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's is an interesting one. Because Dorothy Day said, once we've given to God what is God's, there's not much left for Caesar. And I think a lot of times we, 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 we miss the point of what Jesus was doing there, which I, I think he's, he's spinning everything on its head and calling into question, what is Caesar's? Like, Caesar can have his coins, right? Like, Caesar can print a piece of metal with his picture on it, give it, give it back, give to it him. back to him. But, like, I have made humanity, and that has my image on it. Caesar has no right to that. Uh, and and, and I, I, I think that, that we see this conflict in, in Paul's writing, this working through of it, because on the one hand he says we're to, to respect and submit to the authorities, but then in, in Ephesians he uses the exact same words and says that we are to 
wrestle against, not flesh and blood, but the authorities of this dark world that we're living in. And, you know, of course, like, the one that says respect the authorities goes to jail and gets beaten up for subverting the authorities, you know? So I think it's, it's a beautiful uh, dissonance, to, to, to dialectic to live in that. Um, and I, I see in Jesus what, what John Howard Yoder calls revolutionary subordination. Yes. This idea that we're to, to submit ourselves to the authorities, but we expose their evil and their darkness by allowing them to pour, you know, to, to um, you know, throw us in jail. Or Dr. Yes. Dr. King says so well, you can throw us in jail and we'll still love you. You can threaten to burn down our houses and we'll still love you. You can put your dogs on us and shoot us with your water hoses and we will still love you, but we will wear you down by our love. <laughs> And I think that's exactly what Jesus does in Colossians. It says that as he died on the cross, he made a public spectacle of the powers and authorities of this world. And, and, and that, that's a beautiful image that I, I think the greatest theological stunt ever pulled, you know, this resurrection uh, 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 rising above all of the wrath of empire. And can I just say one, one okay, thing? Quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, quickly. Uh, it, it's a very important with regard to Romans 13 to realize that the chapter divisions weren't in the original. So read it in the light of Romans chapter 12. And there Paul says, never return evil with evil. If your enemy is hungry, give him something to drink. Uh, uh, eat. Give the thirsty, give him something to drink. Uh, never exact vengeance. Two verses later, God uses government to exact vengeance. So God uses government to do good things. They're supposed to anyways. But he expressly forbid us to do that. And therein lies the separation of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. So here illustrated on this stage is the fact that to be evangelical is not one thing. Not, um, apparently not. That you can love the Bible in common and take it seriously and have different interpretations. Um, some people might listen to you talking about the kingdom, Greg, and think that that's not real world talk, but it absolutely is real world talk absolutely. for you. Um, I think this is a great illustration of what I said at the beginning, I think this moment of discernment that evangelical Christianity is in. I, a question I have is, um, and this is maybe a, another way that we are all influenced by the culture we live in, the, the ways we know to grapple with hard questions on which we disagree are to fight and debate and be angry with each other. Um, are there resources deep within evangelical Christianity that you have in common, that everyone in this room has in common, to disagree, to possibly move towards um, uh, uh, reconciliation is too strong, but uh, not necessarily move towards the same answers, but move towards wa walking together mm -hmm. as evangelicals in, in, with these questions? How do you, how do you think about that? Let me, let me give you a personal anecdote that may help you. When I, came out of, when I first came to Christ, before I went to prison, uh, a small group of men, five of them, uh, kind of embraced me. And I, I was discipled by them. Uh, one of them is today former governor of Minnesota, Al Quie. Mm -hmm. One of them uh, was a man by the name of Harold Hughes, who was as liberal a Democrat, anti-Vietnam War, opponent of Richard Nixon as you'd ever find. He heard me give my testimony one night he said, I've just listened to you. You love Christ. I love Christ. We're brothers. I'll stand with you anywhere. Embrace me. Great big 280-pound ex-truck driver, ex-alcoholic. And all through Watergate and all through the years that followed, he helped me get started in the prisons. We were best friends. We never probably voted for the same candidate. But you can love each other. Uh, doesn't mean you even have to like each other. But we're commanded to love each other. And sure, we're going to find political expression in different ways. Uh, I think there are some issues that are transcendent for all of us. I think justice itself is a transcendent issue. But and yeah, yet we it's, can, always, it's sometimes hard even to talk about what justice looks like yeah. or where to begin in, in seeking justice. Well, I think we, I, I think the civilized world has had enough experience at what is just and to be able to make a. I don't think we can much improve on the Greek's definition, or maybe the Bible's definition is even better which is shalom, that is the condition in which there's human flourishing. I think we could agree on that. I think all evangelicals would agree on that. Uh, but we're not, we don't march locked up into the ballot box. I, I said that in Kingdoms in Conflict, now God and Government. Uh, but certain issues demand that we get involved. Now there is a respectable Mennonite tradition, Yoder and others are part of it, which say we just will stand back, create an alternative community, let the world see a better way. That's an honest difference of opinion that's gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I happen to belong to more of a 
Niebuhr School, that we are to uh, make an impact for Christ in how we live our lives and in uh, challenging the political systems. Uh, but, it's a, but you can still be an evangelical and come from either one of these traditions. And you know, Chris, I think that's one of the things that's exciting about this conversation, especially for younger folks, that we don't want to repeat the, the, the mistake that the generation before us has made in, in, uh, in, in like just this bitter, antagonistic meanness. You know? And if there's anything that I've learned from like conservatives and liberals, it's that you can have all the right political answers and still be mean. And nobody wants to listen to you if you're mean, you know? <laughs> and and, and I, I think that one of the things that we can do is learn to disagree well. And I think there is a new conversation happening with evangelicalism in post-religious right America that is much healthier. And we can actually learn to disagree well mm -hmm. and wrestle with hard truth and, and, and hopefully then have ways that we embody all the ideas that we have that uh, can give us integrity. The thing that I think is really amazing in the Gospels is that Jesus chooses uh, uh, Simon, a zealot, to be one of his disciples. They were the radical political revolutionaries, used violence when necessary. And uh, then he chooses Matthew, a tax collector, uh, the defender of the status quo, quo. And the difference between those two folks was greater than Ted Kennedy and Rush Limbaugh. I mean, they were at <laughs> absolute opposite sure. ends. In fact, zealots sometimes would assassinate tax collectors. And he calls them both to be his disciples, and we don't hear one word about it, which tells me uh, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, Simon's a little bit more right, or it, he, it tells me that the kingdom he is incarnating, embodying, and now motivating his disciples to follow is so different that to have Christ in common is to render inconsequential all of the particular opinions you have about what government should do. Uh, and when, when Jesus is president, uh, those sorts of things just are rendered of very secondary importance. Okay, you know the great uh, religious historian Martin Marty says that for him the much more interesting distinction is not between conservative and liberal, but mean and non-mean. <laughs> he says, you know, Billy Graham was not mean. And, and then we've had another generation of a few Christian voices who I think struck the public as mean. And he also said liberals can be mean as much as conservatives can, and that, that really is yeah, that the is. important distinguishing factor. Um, Let's open this up, and John Raymond is going to come up to the podium and read some of the questions and summarize. Um, there are probably some questions, uh, some, some themes that recurred, and so we've tried to capture that. Okay, first question. What should the role of Christians be to tolerate the political views of non-Christians? Mm. Who wants to start with that? Well, I, I, I Greg never, be, never been hesitant before in my life, so might as well weigh in. Um, see, I think it's, it's, it's sad that that question has to be asked, but I'm glad it's asked. Um, the role of Christians in tolerating the political views of non-Christians, see, I don't think that should be the issue. Our role is to love them like Jesus loved us. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. Our role is to serve them, bleed for them, uh, ascribe unsurpassable worth to them as God is to us. And what, what grieves me is that so often we put political hoops to, for, for people to jump through to get into the kingdom. Um, and that just tells me our focus is, is somewhat off. So our role in dealing with uh, people who have got different political opinions than ours, I, I tell my congregation, do not let that be an obstacle to the thing you're called to do, which is loving them and serving them. And don't let it be an obstacle to them coming into the life of Christ. Uh, hoops you have to jump through. This may break the mood here, but I agree with him completely. Uh, <laughs> I knew he'd come Christians, around. Christians have always been the greatest defenders of religious liberty. We defend the religious liberty of Muslims, of every faith group, because it, it, it is a gift of God that we have this freedom to worship. And we live in a pluralistic society, for goodness sake, so people are going to have People who aren't Christians are going to have different views than we do. People who are Christians are going to have different views than I do. But this is what the, the great melting pot America is, where we're free to express our views and not be persecuted for it. Mm. I, I also would just add that uh, C.S. Lewis was so wise when he said the world doesn't exist in, in, in this uh, polarization of 100% Christian and 100% non-Christian. And he said there's a lot of things that would call themselves Christian that are day by day looking a lot less like Jesus. And there's a lot of other things that would never profess, you know, profess anything to do with Christ, but 
they look a lot like the kingdom of God and a lot like the things that we're going for. And I think that's where Jesus would say, if they're not against us, they're for us. Let's work together on that. Um, and and, and uh, so I, I would be very careful to that, to also to get the, the log out of our own eye, you know, uh, where we're pointing fingers at, you know, gay people for destroying the family at the same time that evangelical divorce rates are surpassing the larger society, you know. And, like, we have a lot of work to do ourselves, and, and uh, we should start there. Amen. Yeah. Two related questions. Isn't there a danger of using God to justify national policy? And do the panelists support capitalism and a strong military? <laughs> those, are, those, those questions won't take very long to answer at all. They're really simple. Well, you want to go first? Well, sure. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'll hit both of those, but I, I, uh, I think that when we're called to be, to be this new humanity, this new kind of people, a part of what we're, uh, we, we have an identity that transcends nation or family, you know, that, that uh, as Chuck was saying, a love for our own people is not a bad thing, but our love doesn't stop at the border. Right? I mean, we've got a transnational family that's incredible, that's ancient. And I, I really learned that when I was in Baghdad. When I was over in Iraq, I met with this bishop after one of the most powerful worship services I've ever seen. I said, I had no idea that there's so many Christians in Iraq. And he looked at me, and he was very gentle. But he said, yeah, this is where it all started. <laughs> and uh, he said, that's the Tigris River, and that's the Euphrates. Have you heard of them? <laughs> And then he told me, he said, I kid you not, he said, uh, you didn't invent Christianity in America. You only domesticated it. Uh, you go back and you tell the church in the United States that we are praying for them to be the body of Christ. And uh, that, that just continues to echo in my mind. And I think it put me in my place of, you know, like where, where we, we're not the center of the world, you know, but we're a part of an ancient story uh, that, that, and a beautiful narrative. And, and, and to, so that, I think that... Uh, you know, sums a lot of it up for me. And, and we're called to a different economic reality. So, you know, the question of capitalism, um, I, I, I'm not a socialist. You know, I, I always say that uh, uh, once we really discover how to love our neighbor as ourself, capitalism as we see it won't be possible and Marxism won't be necessary. But, but it's rooted in love and redistribution as, uh, for Christians uh, is a redistributive economy, but it's not something that the, the government enforces on us, but it's something that we do because we understand we're born again into the most tragically dysfunctional family in the world. We got folks that are starving to death while others of us are building new million dollar church buildings. And that, that should break our heart. Amen. Chuck Olson. Uh, church in Acts 4 was described as people who held everything together in common and who didn't have that was given to them. So it was the perfect uh, church of sharing completely with one another. Uh, that's the church, but we live in a fallen world. In my opinion, in a fallen world, capitalism is the best system possible because it gives the greatest amount of human freedom. And it prospers when there are free minds and free markets and free political structures. And that's why it's grown so well in the West. It was, a, as I mentioned in my talk this morning, a Christian innovation because it started in the Italian city-states when they began to have private enterprise and they were influenced by Augustine's teaching and realized that you could barter and trade back and forth between people. That commerce revolutionized the West. It produced the most prosperous society ever, which remains, and I'll take issue with what you said about Barack Obama. I haven't applauded many things he said, but I would have to, sorry, I would have to say that when he said it's America is the world's last best hope, it is in terms of the noble experiment we have in freedom, which we desperately need to preserve. Um, you know, there are many, and as you know, who would disagree with your interpretation of whether Christianity was the origin of freedom or, uh, and capitalism and those things, but that would take us too far astray. Um, from my perspective, two things I'll say. One is that if the kingdom always looks like Jesus, always looks like Jesus, manifested on Calvary, um, then it doesn't look like capitalism or socialism. It doesn't look like America or Iraq or China or anything. It doesn't look like any of that. It's, it's sui generis. It's one of a kind. It's utterly unique. And so whatever anyone thinks about capitalism, you know, as, as a kingdom person, 
I may think it's a good thing, or I may think it's a bad thing. I may think America is the greatest nation on earth, or I may think it's the beast of revelation. That shouldn't make any difference if Shane and I and Chuck say, look, at how can we together serve this world, bleed for this world, sacrifice for the world? And insofar as we're doing that, we're doing the kingdom. You may be a Matthew, I may be a Simon the Zealot. What difference does that make? Let's bleed. Can I just say one thing about the militarism thing? Because yeah. I, I think that there's a lot of things that we can agree on in this. And uh, for instance, I was just on a panel with a guy from the Department of Defense. And uh, I got to ask him a question, so I was ready to ask him to stump the teacher question. You know? And I, I said, well, part of why we uh, know that you know, Saddam Hussein had weapons is because we have the receipts. You know? and, uh, and, and, uh, and we talked about, you know, the fact that the U.S. is, is one of the l largest, uh, companies like Lockheed Martin and others are some of the largest profiteers of, of, uh, of arms trafficking in the world. And, you know, Jesus says if we pick up the sword, we'll die by the sword. What, you know, do we have a duty in, in trying to rethink how we're, we're doing that? And this guy, you know, in the Department of Defense, he said, absolutely, we do. And that's something we can work together on. Hmm. And so I, I do think that there are some things that we can agree on. And as a Christian, there are some things that are totally illogical. Like the, fault, the foolishness of the cross makes no sense to smart bombs, right? And enemy love makes no sense to uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is not the best way to lead the largest superpower in the world, right? And yet I think it's the, like the, the very center of the heartbeat of Jesus and that so many soldiers right now, especially that are Christians, feel this deep collision this identity crisis inside of them. I know because I live with some of them right now and I get letters from them every week and they feel like, they, they say things like, I'm trying to serve two masters and I don't feel like my arms are big enough to carry the cross and the sword. You know, how, and I think you know, right now the suicide rate's like 17 a day of soldiers and veterans. And, and so it should cause us all to say, maybe we're doing some things that are contrary to what we're made for, to love and to be loved. And, 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 and I think we can't compromise that, that, that Jesus um, it shows us what perfect look like, love looks like when he, on the cross. And when it stares evil in the face, it says, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And to me, that's the heart of the gospel, is that there's something worth dying for, but there's nothing in the world worth killing for. Not freedom, not democracy, not America, nothing. Next question. Where does the dialogue about homosexuality and the church factor into the future of the evangelical movement? Another small question. <laughs> Chuck Colson, would you like to go first? Well, Romans 1 makes it very clear that creation, that which is made clear to them, is made known to them, uh, the existence of God in creation. And Paul immediately goes on to say those who turn away from it have exchanged the truth for a lie, and they end up, and then he talks about homosexual behavior. The reason he does, I believe, is that's the clearest example of the fact that there is a natural moral order corresponding to the natural physical order. And so something which is so plain on its face uh, is not normative. Now, that doesn't mean we don't love homosexuals. We do and should. And we should not be judgmental about them, and we should not be prudish about it. Uh, we should love them to death and love them into the kingdom if we possibly can. But we have to recognize that it is not the way men and women are made. It is not the way, it is not the way human beings are made. Rick Warren on, on Larry King one night got it best. When Larry King said to him, you're really, you think homosexuality is a sin? And Warren's answer was, it's not normal. He said, stand up a naked man and a naked woman and look at him and you'll see what's normal. That's pretty that's pretty much what Paul is saying in Romans 1. Not that he's judging them as inferior, but simply that they violate the moral order which is intended to conform to the physical order. I think the question is about how the church and how evangelical Christianity grapples with the fact that even the statement that you just made, which is so plain to you, is, is not the way everyone sees it. it, it, it um, and so, and, and, and this issue has been so bitterly sure. divisive. If I could weigh in, um, it seems to me that there's two fundamental issues that we evangelicals do have to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. The one is simply uh, the terrible, uh, abysmal track record the church has towards gays. Um, and 
you know, the, the, the reputation out there is that evangelicals are homophobic, and I don't think that's the liberal media that's spinning that. I think we've earned the right to, to have gotten that. Um, we have a sin gradation list, uh, and I do see it as sin. I think it, Chuck is absolutely right, Romans 1. It's not God's ideal. It misses the mark, hamartia. That's the word for sin. It misses God's ideal. Uh, but what's happened is we have a list, and our sins, uh, you know, like gossip and greed and gluttony and not caring about the poor and all the stuff that's mentioned all the time in the Bible, we minimize. You can be a church member and have that stuff, but the homosexuality uh, issue is also in the deal breaker. And, and who, who christened that the deal breaker sin? I, I, I don't get that. Uh, and so uh, what, what I tell people, this is my second point, is that, uh, actually, there'll be three. But uh, that if you want to impact th that issue, s s find some gay folks, make friends with them, get involved in their life, turn off your judgment mechanism, uh, and serve them and love them and influence them that way. That's a kingdom way to influence them. Which is the third point is simply this. What I really think, I used to wonder why did Jesus attract prostitutes and other you know sinners that were judged by religion, and the church doesn't. We tend they tend to stay away from us as much as the Pharisees. Um, and one of those reasons might be that Jesus never made a pol public, public policy trying to pass laws against them. And here's where politics can get in the way of our gospel message. They don't want to hang out with us because we made a platform out of uh, you know, going after them instead of our, our own sins, instead of the divorce that's destroying the family. And, uh, and so I think we've got to wrestle with that one. When, when I got to Philadelphia, I met a kid in college who told me, he was attracted to men, and he felt like God had made a mistake when God made him. That's what he felt from the church. It's what he felt from society. He felt that, you know, from, from hearing things like this is not natural. Um, and so he felt like God made a mistake, mistake, and he wanted to kill himself. And that breaks my heart. And, I, and I, I feel like if that kid can't find a home in the church, who have we become, right? That... that we need to attract the people that Jesus attracted. And Jesus attracted the hurting, the broken, the socially ostracized. Uh, and then we'd be about healing. But that's the Spirit's job is to heal. Billy Graham said that it's uh, the Spirit's job to convict, God's job, job to judge, and our job to love. And we need to make sure that we get those right. And I think especially in the church, the church has not been marked by love for, for sexual minorities and for people who are um, uh, gay and lesbian. And, and in fact, this study that we talked about earlier, uh, released in a book called Unchristian by the Barna Research Group, shows that Christians around the United States uh, and non-Christians, uh, it talks about their perceptions of, of, of Christianity. And the number one perception of people outside of Christianity, uh, of what Christians are, is anti-gay. That's number one. And that, I think that should break all of our hearts. I think it should, you know, it breaks the heart of Jesus. Uh, so, so we need to be communities that magnetize people uh, and, and, and where people can find intimacy and love. Part of, I think, the tragedy in the church, uh, in the evangelical church, is that we've, we, we've idolized uh, marriage to the point that that's what everybody feels like they have to do, you know? And, and that, that's such a shame. I can remember hearing a children's sermon where the pastor showed a picture of a husband, wife, and two kids and prayed for all of the children that they would find the one that God has for them. Oh, I mean, that's horrible theology, you know? Uh, Mother Teresa, oh, bless her heart, she didn't find her hubby. You know, like, like what is... And, and I think if we created communities where people can experience intimacy and love, we transcend some of these issues. Uh, but, but as one of my mentors says, he's been celibate for 50 years, and he says, he says, we can live without sex, but we cannot live without love. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of sex, but they don't experience love. And there's a lot of people that never have sex their entire lives, and they experience deep intimacy and love. And the church should be a place where people are freed up to love and be loved. And Jesus so, says that is how we're supposed to be known, John 17. He leverages everything on the church having a reputation for manifesting the love that he manifested. And so it's absolutely tragic that we're known for anything other than that. Saying. Chuck Colson, you wanted to add? Yeah, let's not be too hard on ourselves. I've worked in the prisons over 1978. I ran into my first AIDS patient in a prison woman who was dying, and uh, I didn't know how you communicated AIDS. Uh, she was in an isolation cell. I went in and ended up hugging her and embracing her and leading her to Christ. And I, over the years since, 
have run into hundreds of people dying with AIDS, cradled them in my arms. So have all the volunteers who have gone in. I think that's a bad rap. I have yet to hear a Christian bash a homosexual. I've heard Christians say they'll pray for their conversion and, they'll, and, and they're welcome in a church. They still have to live by the same chaste behavior all unmarried couples have to live in. I think it's a bad rap. I don't think we're homophobic at all. I think that's a stereotype because we have been so uh, committed to the preservation of the moral order. I think we've gotten a bad rap. Well, we're not going to resolve this one here, but I, w I would say even though there are some differences and, and there's some nuance in w how you've each responded, um, I, I actually do hear the common note that this is not, cannot be and should not be, as you said, the deal breaker, the divisive issue. Um, that, then the question is, how, how, how does the church get to that place? Next question. What does the world look like where Jesus is commander in chief? Who was it who wanted Jesus to be commander in chief? I think that was you, Shane. You have to answer for this one. Uh, it, it's an interesting. It's an interesting thing because I think that uh, so often we think that it's going to be a new king or president that leads us to peace or lead, you know ends poverty or whatever. And and the 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 thing that the prophets say in Mike and Isaiah, uh, a verse I just love, is it says. Uh, my people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and, and uh, nation will not rise up against nation. And what I see in that, what I hear in that, is it do peace doesn't begin with nations. It begins with a people who are set apart, uh, a people who refuse uh, to fight the wars of nations, people who transform the things that have brought death and the things that bring life and turn those, those weapons into, you know, uh, uh, farm tools. And, and, and so I think that's the transformation that Jesus points us to is, is this, this group of people that begin to uh, know that the kingdom of God is coming so much that we begin to enact it. And we begin to live into that world that we know is coming. As, as Jim Wallace says, faith is believing despite the evidence and watching the evidence change. So we, we, we are so certain of what we hope for, and that's what Hebrews says, right? That we begin to live into it. And, and that's the invitation of Jesus, is that we're to live the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That, that it's not just something we hope for when we die, but something we live on earth. And I would say that's what it looks to. I mean, look at Luke, where Jesus' political manifesto is, uh, you know, freedom for the captives and returning sight to the blind and raising the dead. And, and it's good news to the poor. And if our gospel isn't good news to the poor, it's not the gospel of Jesus. I think that's exactly right. Um, that's why the Bible calls uh, believers first fruits. With, a, with the fruit picked ahead of time from the harvest, and our main job is to manifest what the coming harvest look like. Be, be heaven on earth. I always tell my, my folks uh, in, in the congregation that if it's not going to be in heaven, start purging your life of it now. And if, if it will be in heaven, start installing it in your life now. Put off the old self and put on the new self, and, and that's our main job. But until Easter comes for the cosmos and the whole world is the, comes the kingdom of God, what it might look for the reign of God uh, in this world now is not winning... Uh, but Calvary. Uh, it won't look practical. It won't look strategic. Uh, it may look absolutely idiotic because it makes sense to pick up the sword and defend yourself. And Jesus says no. So it may look as impractical and foolish as Calvary, but that's where we have to trust that Easter is coming. And we'll see then that that was the right way to transform the world. Well, Jesus was offered the kingdoms of this world and turned them down. And you'll see what Jesus' reign is like when he returns and establishes his kingdom which is what we all wait and pray and patiently expect. In the meantime, though, <laughs> um, you know, Chuck Colson, one thing you, you talk about in your book, at being at those, that high level of real world power, is that the issues that make it that high up are so unbelievably complex that, and I experienced this too in a, in a different context, that there aren't really decisions left anymore between what's right and what's wrong. It's shades of gray and shades of complexity. Um, and I, I think there is an, an outstanding question about how do you take this vision and, and how can it speak to those levels of complexity and those real decisions that have to be made? And if at that point, faith can have a place in that kind of decision-making process, or if See, I, if I it, if then at that point you, you are using the two kingdom analogy that there are simply 
there's simply another place for that kind of discernment I, and action. Know, one of the things I liked a, a lot about Chuck's book is he talks about the complexity and the ambiguity and the ne necessity of compromise and, and the, 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 the corruption of power. I mean, I, you know, and he nails it. I thought it was beautiful, which is why I was confused by you know, how, how optimistic you still were. But uh, um, I, I thought that was really good. And of course, our faith impacts how we parse through that. You know, people always say, well, vote your faith and convictions. And I like to meet the person who doesn't vote their faith and convictions. Everyone votes their faith and convictions. Um, but the way you trans, because it's so ambiguous, um, the way you translate that faith into political convictions is going to disagree. So uh, it's, it's going to bring about disagreement. So I, my main thing is to say, let's focus on being the kingdom, vote your faith and values like everybody else, but don't christen them as the Christian way to do it. Because that brings Matthew and Simon into conflict with one another. Well, if I understood your question correctly, it's the complexity of issues in government that you deal with. One of the things that I found overwhelming, and I was a very young man when I confronted this, I was under 40, was some of the foreign policy questions which when I was outside of government looked so simple. And then when I started reading all the reports that were coming in from around the world, the intelligence summaries, and I realized that the slightest miscalculation could create Armageddon. It was a chilling experience. And all anyone can do in office is pray, as Lincoln did, that in issues of life and death that are in his hands, uh, that God might give him the wisdom to deal with it properly. But there's no easy answers. They all look easy when you don't have to make the, res when you don't have the responsibility for that decision that can be life and death. It's very easy to say you can't kill uh, as a Christian. Well, uh, you and I both admire greatly Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pacifist until he had an opportunity to try to assassinate Hitler, and then he did so. There are cases where, unfortunately, life is just a little too messy for well, those I, kind I of simplistic just answers. Quickly say back, like uh, there's a there's a great movie uh, called Blind Spot. That's an interview with Hitler's secretary, and he says, "What what what?" Uh, the, the secretary says this in the interview. She says, "What was so amazing was." When the uh, assassination attempt happened and the bomb went off, uh, it went off in such a peculiar way that, that Hitler wasn't injured in that. And she said, at that moment, he was more convinced than ever before that God had protected him and his mission. And he went forward with more steam than ever before. And I say on that day, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but I say on that day, the cross lost. And once again, we see this... Um, this attempt at, at uh, um, uh, redemptive violence, you know, kind of bite us again and, the, you know, pick up the sword, die by the sword. And there are incredible movements, uh, it, uh, like some of the ones you mentioned, the Confessing Church and the Anabaptists and the Bruderhof and others that were speaking against uh, Hitler's regime with, with incredible integrity. Uh, and, and Franz, uh, what was uh, one of the folks beatified this year, was a resistor of Hitler's regime. And... Uh, uh, and, and so there were those voices, and, and, and to me that's what has integrity, is that we resist evil as Jesus did, yeah. as Christians, in ways that look like Christ, and, uh, and, and not compromise that. I think we probably have time for one more question, which is the last question. Biblical Christians are stewards of all God has entrusted to us. In America, we have been entrusted with political power, democracy. If Christians know that abortion violently ends innocent human life, how can we not use our political power to end it? We're back to the question your member of your congregation asked. Okay. You know, I, 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 it's true that we are uh, stewards of all that God's given us. Uh, in a democracy, we have the opportunity to weigh in on what we think government should do, and that's correct. Uh, as a person who is to the core of their being nonviolent, because I think that's what God calls us to be, I want to minimize violence. Uh, I want to minimize abortion. Uh, it may be that at this time, the worst way to do that is to insist on everything. Uh, one could argue that the, the main reason kids are dying is because the two sides are so polarized, they're not working together to do what 90% of Americans all say they want to do, and that is the fewer the abortions, the better. Uh, the later the abortion, the worst. You know, they have a lot of different theories, but there's an intuitive sense there. Uh, and so we, can, we could work together 
to minimize abortions and actually save lives if we could come together. But the two sides are so polarized. At least this is one way of looking at it. There are other ways as well. Uh, but I, I could, for that reason, say, I don't want to just go after Roe versus Wade, but I rather want to go at this by building dialogue with people on the other side. Most uh, pro-choice people don't approve of partial birth, birth abortion, but they're afraid if they give in an inch there, the right's going to want to take the whole thing because they're fighting for outlawing the morning after pill. In the meantime, kids are getting aborted. So you can feel righteous about voting pro-life, but you may in fact be killing kids. That's how ambiguous politics are. And that's fine to vote that way. That's follow your faith and conscience. But my whole thing is at least appreciate the ambiguity so you don't call me into question as a Christian if you find out that I vote a different way. Uh, I, 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 take me at my word that I'm pro-life, but I may not vote for your candidate. Uh, and I, I would say if every one of us would just take, uh, take an unwanted child into our home, uh, and, and if we would begin to adopt kids born into tough situations, and if every congregation had groups of uh, teen mothers and fathers that they uh, walked alongside in their neighborhoods. We'll put all those abortion clinics out of business. Amen. The way the the way the question the way the question was posed, there really can't be any ambiguity. I was at the prayer breakfast chain that you were referring to when Mother Teresa stood up, 90-pound Albanian nun, had to have a little stand. Every politician in America and people from around the world were there. She began her talk with a very strong voice. Abortion is the greatest destroyer of peace in the world. She then pointed very pointedly at the Clintons and at other people and said, stop killing babies. That's pretty unequivocal and to me expresses the position every Christian ought to take. I think she was absolutely right to do it. I was one of those who stood and applauded when she did and uh, thank God for her courage and her willingness to take a political position. <laughs> let Mother Teresa have the last word, but she was channeled through Chuck Colson, so I, <laughs> I think, she gets the last word. I, I think I'd like to ask, um, you know, Shane, one of the things you, t and again, let's talk about the challenge of now walking forward in faith together with this ambiguity, with these differences of ways of seeing and living this, sure. living the same faith. Um, Shane, you talk in your book, in your new book, about the virtue of confessing sins, and you feel that, mm. that evangelicals have some sins to confess um, mm. in terms of how this line of religion and politics has been lived for a few years. Along those lines, I, I just want to ask each of you, thinking about one thought, idea, mm, next step um, along this process. Chuck Colson, I like it when you say that this is, this is a, that the evangelical movement is in a process of maturation, that this is a moment of growth. What would you like to offer um, each of you as one, one thing for everyone to take out of the room back to their congregations? One, something practical as well as theological. Confession, I think, is a sacrament. There's something mysterious that happens when we begin with our own contradictions and struggles and we share those and, and yet isn't it wild that it's, it flies in the face of everything that power stands for I mean you can never confess that you did anything wrong you know it doesn't matter if you're Bill Clinton or George Bush like you don't confess until you get busted on tape or whatever you know for uh, doing something wrong with Mon Monica Lewinsky or doing something wrong in Iraq it's so contrary to power uh, to, to confess and yet it's the center of our faith is that we um, we, we confess that we're broken people, and that's the good news of Jesus, is that a church, this, this is, the gospel is not for healthy people, but for sick folks, you know, and this is, uh, uh, I think, what, par, a part of what we lost within evangelicalism, because we end up thinking that you, you got to look like you have it all together to come, you know, be a part of the church. Uh, and, and, uh, and I lament that, you know. Uh, my friend Don Miller uh, wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz, and in the book he talks about how on their campus they set up these confession booths. Uh, but it wasn't to bring in people so that they could confess their sin, but actually people would come in and these folks were dressed as monks and they would confess their sins and the sins of, uh, of Christianity and of evangelicalism and, and the bloodstained pages of history. Uh, where, and and there, there's something healing in that, I think, when people see 
Christians that are willing to get on our knees and beat our chest and say, God, have mercy on us sinners, and not the kind of Christians that just point our fingers at other people and say, thank you that we're not like them. So I think the world's really hungry for Christians that have that humility and, and that feels a lot like Jesus. Amen. I, I always feel like I give a biblical commentary to what you just said. But uh, Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 1, uh, I am, here's a worthy saying for all to repeat that Jesus came into, into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's a saying that we should all be saying. I am the worst of sinners. And Jesus, of course, talked, uh, said to us, uh, why, why do you go looking for a dust particle in your neighbor's eye when you've got a two-by-four sticking out of your own eye? And he's not just talking to people who are exceptional sinners. He's, they're probably better than average. But the kingdom stance of humility is that whatever I think I see in someone else's eye, I should, or in someone else's life, I should regard mine as being worse than that. And if a fraction of Christians did that, instead of being known as, as, as being moralist and posturing and all this, we'd be known as the most humble, serving, loving servants in the world. And I believe that that's what looks like Jesus, and that's what brings people into the kingdom, and that's what's eventually going to transform the whole world. Be like Jesus. My one message would be agreement with both of those, confession certainly and humility, because the last thing we need to do is be arrogant. We have nothing to be arrogant about. The only thing we have is a gift which God has given us. And we should treasure it and share it winsomely and lovingly with the rest of the world. My one prayer would be that Christians would understand better what they really believe, the core of their beliefs, why they matter, why we believe them, and how to present them winsomely in a world that is so polarized and divided and alienated. Let's be agents and instruments of reconciliation, which is what the gospel enables us to do. Thank you so much to Ken Caver and Greg Boyd and Kate Dalton. Thank you for coming.